All right, good afternoon, everyone, and I'm really excited to be here. I recently joined Infoblox. It's a great time to join the company, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll learn a little bit today. I'm going to start with the Infoblox belief system. This is essentially what we see happening in the market, where we think we're going, and ultimately how that's going to affect our long-term strategic technology direction. You heard Scott talk about this, applications becoming massively distributed. They started out in the data center, running on individual servers, begin to run across servers, then between data centers, and today they extend out into the internet. Analytics-driven. Almost all applications manage data. They produce this data in a set of reports, and a human being reads those reports, analyzes the information, which ultimately drives business decisions. We see that analysis piece being moved into the applications and machines doing that analytics. Networks becoming more application aware. So software-defined networks for a while has been all about separation of that control plane and that data plane and making cheaper networking infrastructure. But for me, the value has always been in that abstraction, making sure that an application can declare to the network, this is what I need to run, and the controller is being able to say, I know what it is to need, and then configuring the network. You take the person out of the middle. When you do this, that network is now application aware. If you take that function to the rest of the infrastructure, storage, compute, virtualization layers, you end up in somewhere in the software-defined data center world, where now what you have is a set of controllers that can read that application information and, through a set of policies, ensure those applications get what they need from the network. Hybrid cloud clearly becoming the dominant pattern. As Scott mentioned, every enterprise that I've spoken to in the last three to four years either has a hybrid cloud or is in the process of implementing it. Applications and network services, specifically those that we operate, such as DNS, are beginning to be delivered more and more as a service. Security. We do see a fundamental shift here. Historically, in my career, it was always about keeping the bad guys out. You'd have a hardened perimeter through a set of firewalls, and you were trying to keep the bad guys from getting into your networks. What we see today is people realize they're going to get in through a variety of mechanisms. But what's important is when you have this breach, you need to be able to detect that breach quickly and take automatic remediated action. And then finally, tomorrow's networks. What happened in compute is happening in networks. Jesper talked about this a little bit. No longer the need for these custom ASICs. You can now get network processing on commodity x86 processors. So now I'm going to apply that to where are we headed. But I want to start with this. Again, Jesper talked about it. Scott talked about it. I cannot reemphasize how important this is. We are the entry point to the network. When a device comes up, the first thing it does is it needs an IP address, and it gets that through DHCP. The next thing it does is it needs to communicate with other devices. So it has to contact DNS to say, how do I get in touch with these other devices? Again, the analogy being the phone book for the internet. Our IPAM solution, we have additional data. When a device comes on the network through DHCP, we know something about the type of device it is and some of its configuration information. For networks, we know what type of network it is. Is it a development network? A production network? Is it a business critical network? Is it a public facing network? We have all that information. And finally, we deliver that in a highly available distributed architecture we call the grid today. These capabilities are fundamentally important. It is very difficult for someone to build distributed architectures, which is what makes us different from most of our competitors. But what it does for us is it puts us at a very good position to take advantage of emerging trends in the security space, cloud, the Internet of Things, and analytics. Let's talk about that journey to the cloud. So 15 years ago, when you bought an application, the IT department went out and bought dedicated hardware for it. And that's what they installed in the data center. Infoblox initially shipped the application embedded in hardware. Ten years ago, as VMware made virtualization popular, applications began to get deployed on top of virtualized infrastructure. We followed suit by delivering our virtual appliance. As we mentioned, things are moving into the hybrid cloud. Customers are extending their networks out into places such as Google and Amazon and Azure. And as they do that, we're going to follow suit, and this is the demo that Scott did around the Amazon Virtual Grid member. Now, in all of these first three phases, the enterprise is still managing the application, which takes us to phase four, which is now when the application is delivered as a service. And for us, 
that brings forward a bunch of SaaS opportunities for Infoblox. And I'll take a, a moment to mention that in my previous life, I was responsible for the initial implementation, the ongoing engineering and operations of our SaaS uh, offerings. And so I have a good understanding of the technical and business challenges with delivering SaaS, but also the value it can bring to your customers and to your business. So let me talk about what you're looking at. The first thing we'll need to do is develop an Infoblox cloud. Very likely, we'll do that on top of a public cloud, such as Amazon. We'll need secure connections down into the enterprises, onto their on-prem networks, and if they've extended into a public cloud through a hybrid cloud, we'll need to be able to get access to those too. We'll need a service delivery platform. If you think about customers being able to request services, us to be able to automatically configure and provision those services, to be able to operate them and ultimately meter and bill them, we'll need that service delivery platform. Now, if you look at these sets of services I have up here, the one that's most obvious, way on the left there, is DDI as a service. What customers use us for today, on-prem, we can now deliver as a service from our cloud. The deployment is mostly going to look like this. So we would run our grid masters up in our cloud, but customers are going to want to deploy the grid members on-prem. They're going to want DNS and DHCP, these critical tier one services, running on-prem. They can do that in hardware, or they can do that as virtual appliances, and they can run them up in the public cloud. What we'll do is we'll manage the installs, the upgrade, patching, backups, restores, capacity planning, all this for the customer themselves. So the customer only has to manage their DNS, DHCP, and IPAM. Reporting. We ship a reporting hardware appliance today. But one thing I've learned is customers have an insatiable desire for more and more reports. I don't think you could ever satisfy that need. If we deploy this into the cloud, what we do is we redirect the stream of data from all those appliances away from the on-prem reporting server up into the cloud. So that means we have that data. Now, when we want to deliver reports, we can do that very quickly because we own that back end. I can deliver new reports every day if I need to not once every six months when we ship a new release. Furthermore, if customers want custom reports, our professional services organization could deliver those reports to customers. Again, because it's running in the cloud, we can do this very quickly. Now let's talk about that data. So now I've got all this data coming from all these on-prem customers, and I can do this for all of our existing on-prem uh, customers today. All we need to do is redirect our stream of data up into the cloud. Once we have that, we can go into this analytics phase. We can take that data, run it through an, an analytics engine, and provide that analyzed data back to our customers, those insights back to them. But more importantly, we now have this data from many different customers. So we can apply that analysis across all of that data from multiple customers, which gives us a richer and maybe more accurate set of analysis that we can provide back to our customers. Threat intelligence. You heard Scott talk about our DNS firewall. The way that works today is we get a subscription from a third-party vendor who provides threat intelligence information down to that firewall on a recurring basis and allows them to keep the bad guys out. The first step for us will be make sure that that threat intelligence is delivered from the Infoblox cloud. So it's coming from us. What that allows us to do is to pick and choose from the best threat intelligence on the market today to deliver to our customers as well as our own threat intelligence. Now again, if I have this analytics capability, I can actually couple in all of this DNS data. So you can imagine, we now have more and more data to provide better analytics, to provide a better product back to our customers. And finally, DNS as a service. There are other players out in the space today that provide this. There's certainly value we can deliver. If customers are running their on-prem DDI, we can obviously manage their external with the same set of tools. But really, a lot of players out there today are getting into that commodity service. The way we prevent that from happening is by coupling it with our threat intelligence and that analytics of all that DNS data we have to provide a much more high value offering. We talked about the Internet of Things. We've talked about the statistic up here, you know, 5 billion today going to 25 billion. I personally think that number is a little bit low. Uh, I have 20-something devices at my home network today, and it's growing. I'll probably hit 30 in the next few months. The important point again, all these things need IP addresses, they need DHCP. 
They all need to talk to other things, which means they rely on DNS. All these things need to be secured. And as Scott mentioned, we're in a very good position to be part of that overall security solution. And finally, the Internet of Things is highly geographically distributed, which means they're going to depend on services that are highly distributed and built on distributed architectures like our grid. And they'll need analytics to be able to extract the value. The Internet of Things, big data and analytics. I call your attention to that very last statistic out there, 50 trillion gigabytes of data. Now, we're not going to process that 50 trillion gigabytes of data, but we will process some of it, right? And some of it very key. And how do you go about doing that? So the first thing is you have to be able to collect all this data from all these endpoints very quickly and aggregate them at velocity, which means collect all that information and store it in a big data pool, right? You also have to understand not only the devices, the endpoints, and the data coming from them, but the relationships between those devices and other devices. It's not going to be helpful if all you see is these in isolation. And so taking that relationship information and the devices and all that data, the way you extract value is to collect it quickly, aggregate it, and perform near real-time analytics on that data to deliver that business value. So let me bring it a little closer to home to what we do in Inside Infoblox. It's all about having that big data platform. We talked about as doing that in SaaS. We apply machine learning. So now we have machines doing the analysis, looking at the data coming in. And when machines do this, they develop behavioral models. They say, I understand what normal steady state is for your network. And then what that allows you to do is do predictive. You can start saying, I understand where things are going to head. And you can also do anomaly detection. When something happens, it's out of the normal. Right? So again, what data do we have? We have DNS, DHCP, and IPAM data, all that additional data around networks and devices. We have our threat intelligence information. And we have topology information. Topology information comes from our network insight products and our net MRI products, which is at the network level. This is augmentation to that relationship information. So not only do we have DNS servers talking to each other, but we have network topology information. If we take all that, and now we add in Moore's Law. So now we have our big data engine up in the cloud. We're collecting all this information. We're doing all this analysis, developing these behavioral models. So we have a lot of intelligence running in the cloud. But now we want to couple that. So with Moore's Law, you have these very inexpensive, very fast processors that now you can deploy to the edges of your networks. These can do things like deep packet inspection and get fine granular data and send that back up to the cloud so that you have this continuous analysis going on. But because you're at the edge of the network here, you can also take local action. You can look at the data coming in. You can analyze it with what you're getting from the big brain up in the cloud and take definitive action based on a set of policies. So now you have this ability to couple components at the edge with your big data analytics running in the cloud and take automatic remediated action. All right, so I've been talking a lot of ethereal stuff here. Maybe you believe me, maybe you don't. I want to take it now down to a real-world example of what's happening inside Infoblox. So the first thing, as I mentioned at the very beginning, security is moving towards this ability to rapidly detect when you have a breach and take automated remediated action. Again, the way you do that, you have to collect data very, very quickly. You have to perform that analysis and be able to detect things such as anomalies, and then take that action. So let me take a look. This is actually a screenshot from an application uh, my research team developed in-house. It's called Tapestry. The team is read, led by Stu Bailey, who's here today, the founder of the company. This application is running in the cloud, as I described a little bit earlier. It's taking a stream of DNS data coming in from the Infoblox grid running on the IT network. right? And that information is being analyzed in real time as it's being distributed up into our cloud. Now, this is a snapshot from about four weeks ago. And when you look at this, you see a bunch of blue dots on there. And these represent nodes on the internal Infoblox IT network. Think of people's PCs, laptops, mobile devices, servers, network devices, virtual machines, et cetera. The orange dots represent internet nodes. The gray lines represent the communications, who's talking to who, those relationships that I mentioned were so important earlier. And when we start looking at this data through this analysis, we can begin to detect things such as malware. This behavior exhibits looks like malware. 
or a shadow IT site. In this particular example, we were able to detect very quickly that we had this blue node, an internal node, that was making all these connections to all these other internal nodes and to the internet. That's abnormal behavior, so we detected an anomaly. Now, at the time, this system was running isolated, so it wasn't connected to the rest of the IT systems. So we couldn't tell, okay, this is an anomaly, but is it a bad thing or is it an okay thing? So we invented that to IT. IT looked at it and said, it's okay, it's a sanctioned node. We're running it in isolation to basically do some security pen testing and some inventory. But let's assume we had been connected to that system. We would have been able to get that higher signal-to-noise ratio because we'd have been able to take our event and check with other IT systems and say, this one's okay. But what if this actually had been real malware? It looks like malware. If we'd have been able to detect that, the next step is to take that automated remediated action. As Scott described in our DNS firewall, we have that ability as being in the middle of the network to begin blocking those nodes from communicating to other nodes so we can stem that flow. But also, as Scott mentioned, we have many partners who have said, this data you have is highly valuable. So we can now begin to partner with other security vendors to take that remediated action. For instance, we can connect to an SDN controller that has these nodes under control who can then take action against them. And an example of this is with uh, our partnership with Cisco. They have their application policy infrastructure controller, which is essentially their SDN server. And what we did is we generated an event, we passed that information and said, here's an infected node. And the controller was able to take that node that was running in a production endpoint group and move it into a quarantined endpoint group. So there's a lot of opportunities for us to sit in the middle of this ability to take this, to detect very quickly, to know for in fact that we do have an infection, and to be, take that automatic remediated action. So I look at all this and I say, hey, there's a lot of neat things going on here, this massive geographics, this analytics capability, but what it implies to us is that we are going to have to make some fundamental architectural changes. At the top of our list, and probably the most predominant one, is looking at moving towards this container-based microservices application architecture using something like Docker. Again, I did this in my previous career. I spent a 12 to 18 month cycle with my engineering team taking a very monolithic application and breaking it up into a set of microservices and running these things in containers. Okay. You get a lot of value from that. First of all, you can rapidly deploy geographically very quickly these small components. If you think about the Internet of Things, that's going to become incredibly important. You have the ability to take on cloud-like behavior. You can do things such as scale elastically in a very linear, horizontal fashion. That means if you have a load-inducing function such as many, many DNS queries or a lot of DHCP requests, you can spin up these containers very, very quickly and take on that load. You can do that through a set of policies. So the policy gets triggered when an event occurs, such as increasing load or decreasing load, and your application scale up or scale down automatically. Agility. You heard Jesper talk about this, Scott talked about it. We need to be more agile. If you look at what you can do at the web scale companies with things like continuous integration and continuous deployment, you can deliver customer value quickly. What that means is that from the time a developer creates a new feature to the time it ends up in production goes from months to weeks to days to hours, in some cases minutes. Very popularized by companies like Google and Facebook. But by moving to this architecture, we can do the same thing obviously in our SaaS space, but we can also do it for on-prem. And finally, security is a first-class citizen for Infoblox. We have that most highly secured DNS server on the planet. As we think about moving to this next generation architecture, we're going to make sure that security is baked in at the platform level. It will not be an afterthought. Open architecture and open source. And I came from an open source company. Um, I worked on open architectures, and what this means is everything today is all about APIs and integration with the ecosystem. Secondarily, you need to be able to look at your architecture of your platform. Historically, when you build enterprise software, you would pick and choose these components, your database, your messaging infrastructure, your app servers, and you'd ex expect to use them for the next five to ten years while you build features around them. In today's world, you get a lot of innovation in open source very quickly, so you have to be able to have an architecture where you can look at taking in that innovation because it reduces your cost and your time to deliver, 
and also keeps you out of those commodity components of you having to build them. And you have to be able to take those things on in a more frequent time frame, maybe even every two to three years. A big lesson learned in my previous life, make sure that your architecture is open so that you can take advantage of these innovations in open source much more quickly. Now, once we do all this, it's going to give us the ability to provide delivery options to our customers in a variety of form factors. We can continue to deliver hardware appliances. That's what customers want. Virtual appliances, if they want to get software only and deliver it on top of bare metal, you can do this with things like Docker containers. You can even run these things on ARM processors. If in this picture, it's a Raspberry Pi. If you're familiar, this is a $30 processor you can buy down at Fry's. It will support these very small Docker containers. And when you think about the Internet of Things, you know that at the edge, you're going to have these very small processors running. It's going to allow us to continue to deliver into clouds through things like Amazon and Google and Azure. But also, we can use it for delivering as a service. So we get a lot of different ways we can deliver our service. So in summary, as Jesper mentioned in his opening remarks, the industry trends, particularly in the areas of the IoT and cloud and the number of devices per person, there is an explosion of IP addresses. And as that happens, there's a greater and greater reliance on the core services that we deliver from our DDI capabilities and on top of our distributed grid. Securing this critical infrastructure is going to be important in the future. And the way you do that is through this ability to have rapid detection when you have a security a violation on your network and being able to take that automatic remediated action. And hopefully I've demonstrated that we're in a position well suited to do that. Finally, we're going to evolve our platform. We're going to build in that same fundamental notion that got us to where we are today in terms of our distributed architecture. But we'll do this through a lot of emerging technologies and we'll take advantage of a lot of open source that we see out there today. As we do this, hopefully I've convinced you that our ability to deliver features to our customers and new capabilities will be greatly accelerated. and do this much, much more quickly and be able to deliver it in a variety of different formats, all the way from hardware, all the way to as a service. That's it for me today. Um, I thank you all for your time. <laughs>